So I'm Marika Trotter. I am the coordinator of history and theory here at SciArc. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Walid Beshti. Walid Beshti has been investigating the intersections between objects and processes, between stillness and movement, and between things and their relations, often working with various kinds of photosensitive technical images since the early aughts when he discovered that a roll of film had accidentally passed through an airport x-ray machine. His work has continued to reveal a fascination with the indexical project, something that is both the thing itself and its record, as well as with the accidental, so breakage, oxidization, the unintended, the leftover. He has produced, for example, an entire series of works based on FedEx's processes in packaging, ranging from shipping labels to the marks produced by handling to FedEx's astonishing copyright on the dimensions of its boxes themselves, in effect producing proprietary volumes of space. Over the years, he has been associated with Nicolas Bourillon's relational aesthetics and has sought to distance his work from medium-specific categories like photography or institutional claims of disciplinarity. As an intellectual, Walid Beshti has argued for the greater importance of sim uh, systems and networks of relationships over any particular object. He has been skeptical of any inherent meaning to things. He is committed to a body of works in progress, works as process. He has located value in the cataloging and capturing of seemingly mundane activities like desk work and seemingly uninteresting things like discarded printouts. He has repeatedly exposed the potential of the dormant and the workaday. Walid Beshti has also made a number of claims that we in the field of architecture ought to consider carefully. For example, his position is that, quote, we can all make aesthetic objects. He has sought to undo discipline or medium-specific attitudes and discursive routines, expressing disinterest in any, quote, grand definition of a particular medium as some sort of ontological construction. Now, in architecture, our general commitment to the discipline, our delight in picking up and continually reanimating various discursive threads, our engagement with specific workflows, et cetera, is perhaps only bested by our enthusiasm for the idea that not everyone should make aesthetic objects, at least at the architectural scale, that there is a gap between the architect's ability to create powerful and beautiful architectural things and the abilities of everyone else. We are also fairly fond of objects, which we typically hesitate to reduce to the actions or systems or relations in which they are entangled, or which might be necessary but not sufficient conditions for their appearance in the world. I mentioned that Walid Beshti has also committed, and certainly this remains one of the most eerie and compelling and surprising attributes of his work, to the avoidance of concealment, to transparently indexical processes that are often one and the same with the work and its objects. As he once remarked, quote, power works by concealing how it functions, by enforcing a ritual naturalizing it. This makes the means through which power functions camouflaged and power itself sublime. This strikes me as an astute observation, but his response to this is very different than the response of many architects who might agree with the sublime and hidden aspects of power, but who would instead attempt to intensify such sublimity and mystery as a way to accrue it. Think, for example, of Walter Gropius, 
who in his Fagas factory deliberately suppresses its actual material tectonics in favor of a fictional, even magical effect, the appearance of a curtain wall before such a thing was possible. So we perhaps have here a really powerful, really productive disagreement on the role of art in the world. Is the work of art to capture or expose aspects of the unfolding process we call reality? Or is the work of art to produce moving objects, objects endowed with power and let loose in the world? Can we do both simultaneously? Let's find out. Hi, uh, thank you so much for that. That was a really generous and thoughtful introduction, and I will not say anything nearly that eloquent tonight. I can guarantee it. So, <laughs> um, and actually, there was a lot that was laid out there that I was gonna kind of start to talk about, so I'll just sort of jump in, but it's great to be here, and thanks again, Rika, and thanks for having me. And um, So I think, well, one of the things I just want to start out by uh, mentioning is that, you know, the, for me, the role of an artist is really, it moves between, or at least the artists that I always sort of thought about and um, I think had the most impact on me were ones that sort of move between disciplinary structures. So I think um, in many ways, you know, I. My, my practice, even though I'm only going to be talking about exhibitions and conventional types of presentation and uh, art, art production, um, very much is intertwined with, with writing and teaching and, and also organizing exhibitions. And actually, I was doing those things before I was really showing publicly in any real meaningful way. So. Uh, in a lot of senses, this is just sort of a, a slice, I guess, of what I think really sort of formulates um, the basis of what I do. Um, I just want to segue over to, there, there are just some kind of basic things that I want to outline and, and the use of some terminology. Um, I like to discuss or, or think about the work in, in relationship to terms like aesthetics. But when I say aesthetics, I don't mean the German romantic um, definition of it, and people in my class sort of have already heard me go prattle on about this, but more the, the Greek sense of aesthetics um, um, from aesthetia or perceptible things. Um, so in the sense of how something becomes knowable to the senses. Um, and I think this definition for me is extremely significant. One. Um, because it's unmistakably corporeal or bodily. Um, it's non-linguistic. It doesn't deal with coding or a kind of semiotic construction of meaning. Uh, but it's premised on the notion of uh, a kind of physical understanding, a grasping of something, a knowledge that occurs through a physical existence, being around a thing or being among other individuals around things and the way that that kind of comprehension is sort of manifest within a group. And in that, on that dimension, it also has, a, has an element of immediacy that a kind of unfolding or other kinds of structures or forms of meaning don't necessarily have. Um, the other dimension to that is I think that there's an inherently political dimension to it because it always deals with the collectivity. Um, it always deals with how a group experiences a particular circumstance. Um, and I should also say that behind me is actually the work that Marika was discussing um, uh, that she mentioned before, which, whose title is a partial, dis a partial Disassembling of an Invention Without a Future, Helter Skelter and Random Notes in which pulleys, cogwheels, and cogwheels are lying around at random all over the workbench. And it's about a, a three quarters of a kilometer long work of uh, 9,000, about 9,400 objects that um, all our uh, cellulose-based material that moved through the studio. And I sort of show that to sort of, um, that this one of the sort of fundamental, another fundamental aspect I think of my practice is that, 
and that Marika also brought up, is, is a notion of transparency. Um, and I think she, <laughs> she actually summarized it quite well. So it kind of feels funny to parrot it, parrot it again. But um, um, the idea that power does conceal, that power operates by concealing, and that the, the experience of objects and the, and the experience of, um, of things in the world uh, is that people are subordinated to, or there's a power relationship implicit in a lack of transparency, and that most things um, enter into a discourse in a way that they conceal their origins. So for me, it's not really, there's, there's certainly a kind of progression within art or a discussion of the revelatory, in other words, revealing dominant power structures, and that's not what I'm interested in, but simply in producing in a way, rather than the, the notion of revelation or to reveal, is the idea of producing without concealing, um, using a kind of transparency. And I think that that's democratizing. It allows equal access to the appearance of things um, uh, for an audience or for individuals, for a lay person who's not involved in producing those things. Um, so, and I, and I just wanted to talk about, this is the only work by someone else I'm gonna talk about. This is Solowit. Um, it's wall drawing number 260 from 1975. It's uh, in MoMA's collection. And I talk about it as a kind of high watermark for a notion of transparency. And what I'm talking about is like a non-revelatory type of work. In other words, there's still this sensorial aesthetic um, kind of dimension, a kind of pleasure in looking. It's, it's active. It has, um, a, at least to me, it's attractive. It's still beautiful. It's still kind of tasteful, which is totally fine with me. But that at the same time, it doesn't create a mystery about its origins or where it comes from. The recipe is right next to it. And it doesn't change the effect or the ability to experience that thing. Um, that one can still engage with it while having a full understanding of how it's constructed. And from very early on, that was quite important to me. And that, that work in particular, that body of work of, of Solowitz, the wall drawings, had a, had a really formative um, effect. I also tend to meander, and I know this is sort of an odd situation to have any call and response, but if you want to interject and act, ask a question, I totally welcome it. Is that too weird? Maybe it's weird. If you feel like it, I don't mind, because it'll keep me on topic. So I'll just meander off into the, into the distance with this. So this is, this is a body of work. They're called Travel Pictures. Um, it's, um, here's the actual title, Travel Pictures, Tchaikovsky Strasse, number 17 in multiple exposures. And uh, those are the airport codes that are associated with the work. And this came from uh, when I was living in Berlin in the early 2000s. Um, I'd read a story about a fire happening in, a, in, an, in an embassy in the Pankow area of, of, e of the former East Berlin, and that the, the fire department was waiting outside to try to, um, they had needed to see flame in order to be able to go on to the site, and they couldn't find anyone to ask permission to go on to the site because of the abandoned Iraqi embassy to the former, D former DDR. And that's what it looked like um, when I visited it. And at the time, it was um, during the period of the coalition provisional authority under, under Paul Bremer. So it was the American occupation of Iraq, the, the debathification of Iraq, and also the, the systematic deconstruction, or, or, or uh, not destruction, but um, through debathification, uh, dignitaries and the foreign, the foreign uh, the foreign relations officers within the country um, were being cycled out and a new constitution was being written. So the site interested me as a kind of sovereignty-free zone. In other words, it was protected as sovereign territory by the Vienna Conventions. And the reason why the German fire department couldn't go on the site unless they saw actual fire and they couldn't get permission was because it was still protected as, as territory of a foreign country. So to go onto the site without getting active permission would be an act of war. It would be a violation of state sovereignty. And it was a, and it was a territory that was maintained by, an, by a country that no longer existed, the DDR, um, for a country that no longer existed, the Ba'athist Republic of Iraq, the 67 
um, revolution. And these are just some snapshots that I took on the site to just sort of explain what ended up happening. Um, the ambiguity of this site, in other words, that it was continuous with the topography of Berlin. It was just an innocu in an innocuous office park. It was just another office building. But that it was actually another country altogether. And the interesting part to me also was by going onto that ground, you were essentially going into another country. And that individuals, it was clear that squatters and kids were hanging out there and drinking beer and doing all this stuff. But that the government couldn't transgress and couldn't go onto that site because that would be a, a declaratory gesture. So, um, or a gesture of war or a violation of sovereignty. And um, so this, there was this collision between the concrete reality or the, the materiality of daily life, the city, the city, the city plan, uh, a random office building, and this abstraction of international law that made it someplace else, someplace foreign and discontinuous. And that tension between abstraction and the continuities of daily life are something that um, has sort of guided my work and interested me ever since. The bizarreness of the site, I was just looking at, um, I was looking back through my notes. I actually prepared for this, which is unusual for me. So it might go, or it might be good. I don't know which way it'll go, because I, I don't usually prepare. So, um, and this is from uh, a paper for the Congressional Research Service uh, for the Library of Congress. So this is actually a congressional uh, information packet on the CPA, and I just found this kind of remarkable. Um, it says, <clears throat> Whether the CPA was a federal agency is unclear. Competing, competing, though not necessarily mutually exclusive, explanations for how it was established contribute to the notion that it was created by the president, possibly as the result of a national security presidential directive, NSPD. This document, if it exists, has not been made available to the public. Another possibility is that the authority was created by or pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution 1483 from 2003. Finally, two years after the CPA was established, a Justice Department brief asserted that the then commander of US Central Command had created the CPA. However, considering that the revelation of this role in the CPA followed other somewhat vague and sometimes contradictory explanations or comments about the CPA's origin during its 13-month tenure, some might suggest that either of the other two alternatives possibly could still be valid explanations for the origin of the CPA. So this is an extension of the US government that's occupying another country and the con Congressional Library and their research staff can't com come up with a compelling justification or even an origin story for where this occupational force is, which is absolutely insane. And it kind of, and, and to me, it got wrapped up in the total bizarreness of the place itself. Um, so these are the, the series of photographs that I took within the site. And when I traveled there, I realized that um, I had put my, my film through check baggage. So, um, in this sort of process of moving through international airspace, you cross through, even though it's materially not present. In other words, you move onto this site or you go into an airport and you pass through the x-rays or you enter customs. There's no physical transformation that you actually seem to go through. But there's a massive change in status. Your status as a citizen subject of a particular country, your rights, supposedly inalienable rights of free speech, uh, right to privacy, of personal, uh, of property, property rights can be revoked in those situations. So even though there was no material transformation that you undergo, um, there is a, a, a distinct transformation in status to this kind of, these sort of limbo zones or these sort of holes in international law. And what I realized was that the film saw this, this movement across borders and actually mapped that movement across borders. That the images or the, the, the sort of haloing that you see on this comes from the passage of the eye of the x-ray uh, the x-ray scanner, um, fogging the film and, and sort of adding these hazes or, or various sort of marks on, on its surface. And, and that, um, that sort of opened up two sort of possibilities for me. One was to imagine a different type of production of pictures. In other words, non-representational pictures, materialist types of pictures. In other words, the two competing depictions here that are going on are the striations of the, of the sine curve of the, the x-ray eye 
and then as it passes through the surface of the film, and then also the literal light inscription of the surface of the rooms that one is looking into. Um, and that seemed to open up another set of possibilities for me that seemed somewhat foreclosed at that point um, in the early 2000s, which was dominated with, by a type of photographic practice that was large, expansive, sort of sublime views of landscapes, a la Gursky or Struth or Roof, um, Struthsky, as people like to call them all together. Um, and that seemed like the dominant house style of sort of contemporary art and contemporary art photography in particular. So a lot of what that sort of, um, I'm probably going too slow already. Yep. Um, Cause we haven't even gotten to 2007 yet. <laughs> but I'm just gonna show the remainder of the, the suite of these photographs. And this is a recent installation of them actually in, in, in uh, Tokyo. And simultaneously, at a right about the same time, it also produces sort of interest in why there hadn't been a certain kind of materialist sort of photography, that under the avant-garde, you had materialist painting or non-representational types of painting. Uh, you had the monochrome, you had Rodchenko's last paintings, you had this deep investigation of the objecthood of painting that was going on. And that when it came to photography, it was always very iconic and highly depictive. And um, I was having this conversation with, um, a friend who was actually Maholi Naj's grandson. And he was like, and I, and I was talking to him and I was saying, why, why weren't there ever crumpled paper photograms? That seems like the ultimate materialist act. In other words, you crumple a sheet of paper, you expose it to light and you uncrumple it. And you have that same kind of tension between a direct transcription of the light on the surface. In other words, that, that would uh, create marks um, where the light falls, but then you would also have the light passing through the substrate of the paper casting an image of itself onto itself. And one of the things with photography is sort of discussing the specificity of the object's size. In other words, how does scale get manifest or, or, or actively dealt with within the construction of an image um, or the construction of a picture? And it seemed to solve that problem, that the shapes and forms that were produced on the surface would be directly tied to the scale of the paper that was being used in the physical manipulation of that paper, and also the circumstances under which it was produced in a very reduced and sort of isolated kind of way. And in a sense, I think I was reconstructing a, a pathway forward out of a certain kind of understanding of how pictures worked. Um, the other problematic that I was sort of running into was this notion of abstraction. First, that abstraction is used in completely the wrong way in most most commonly in, in, in art, art discourses to simply mean non-figurative, which is not totally random to me. And, um, and also the problematics associated with abstraction. In other words, it's naturalization. In other words, to see a schematic, uh, an abstraction is always automatically ideological as a set of rules governing how you transform one thing into another, how you schematize something, how you render it, and so on. And the way that it became naturalized, especially within a photographic discourse, um, seemed particularly problematic to me. Um, and, and so I was interested in, for, and, and also the, the sort of understanding that Renaissance perspectival formula is essentially an abstraction. It's, an ab it's, a, it's a set of conditions under which you transfer the render, a, a three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional space and create a schematic of it. And I was trying to make, even though these look non-figurative, I was trying to make a non-abstract type of photograph, a photograph that didn't depend on abstraction or didn't exist in relationship to some other thing that was not present to a viewer, but existed exactly in the room. And to me, that was a kind of a political question. In the same way that I think that Sala Witt taking an expansive, I think engaging and sort of pleasant wall object that's sort of, um, that uh, tickles the senses in some ways and, and produces a kind of joy in viewership, but that to display how it's made is a political gesture in and of itself, a kind of transparency and a kind of openness to a democratic notion of aesthetics. So to me, a problem that was lingering was this problem within um, photographic discourse that seemed to spill into other discourses as well, moving images and things like that. Um, 
So I'm going to just move on. So for example, this is the title of, of this work. And the reason why I'm showing the titles, which I hadn't done before, but I always forget to even mention them, is that it always provides a kind of explanation and the conditions under which something is produced. And they become more and more obsessive over time. So initially, at, or at this point, what, 2008, 2009, a relatively short and provide a kind of um, basic information about the object. And then these came out of um, those black and white folded objects. So it was taking photographic paper, folding it into a freestanding form, and exposing it to angles of light that describe the object, and then flattening it out. Then it was using, um, these are called uh, multi-sided pictures. Um, so this was folding it into a freestanding geometric form, exposing it to uh, one of the subtractive colors, cyan, magenta, or yellow, which is what all sort of printing is sort of based on, anything that's reflective, um, or is based on bouncing, light bouncing off a surface. And that the technology itself, photographic technology, is sort of un is produced in layers, uh, a cyan layer, a magenta layer, and a yellow layer that creates the full spectrum. And isolating that each sort of side of a, of a particular object would get one particular color. And so this is why this is three-sided picture, cyan, magenta, yellow, March 25th, Irvine, California, et cetera, et cetera. So these are a few more examples. But I didn't want to discount the notion of like, uh, of a kind of, um, tastefulness, I guess is the way that I would put it. That the notion of a tastefulness or a kind of pleasantness or a, a pleasure in looking at a thing was somehow incompatible with like a, a notion of a kind of politicized form of aesthetics. Um, these came later. Uh, these, are, these are called curls. It's basically the same premise, except using the curling, the natural curling of the paper um, to create the striations of color. So in other words, it's unrolled, exposed to one color, re-rolled. Unrolled, exposed to another color, re-rolled. Unrolled, exposed to a third color, and then re-rolled. And then they're all scaled off of my body. This is a, this is a body of work that, again, Marika mentioned. Uh, these are the FedEx works. These start in 2007, um, basically made to the, the scale of the of the FedEx boxes. FedEx boxes are SSCC coded, so there's first FedEx owns the owns the not only the copyright of for the bar, box itself, in other words, the design, but it's also they own the volume because it's standardized shipping container coded, which means that no other shipper can actually use the same shape as FedEx. And that as a kind of reply to a minimalist discourse, but also the discourse around the modular as this sort of archetypal or this sort of pure form of a scalar, that it would be situated within the sphere of intellectual property of a particular corporation. The notion that the idea of a particular shape could be possessed or could be uh, a corporate property. And I made these out of um, clear glass and also mirrored glass or two-way mirror glass. The other aspect of this work, that, that's what initially interested me and also that I was doing a show and I only had my gallery's FedEx account number. So I was like, how can I just use that as a mechanism? And also use this sort of international circulation of objects as the production system. Because for a while I had been kind of um, interested in this idea of ready-made means of production. In other words, parasitically feeding off a ex pre-existing kind of structure, say FedEx, or say the security system, TSA, and use that as an aesthetic producer. Use that system against its grain in some way to generate a different kind of outcome, other than one that reinscribed its authority or sublimity or lack of access, lack of transparency. To use FedEx not simply as something that you place down a box and then it miraculously appears somewhere else, but to use it as an aesthetic engine, as an engine to produce different kinds of um, possibilities for an experience of a thing and different types of things. Um, these works are always added to the titles every time they're shown. So you can see there's 
it went Los Angeles to New York, and that's the tracking number, and then it was uh, New York back to Los Angeles. And then every time they're exhibited, they have to travel via FedEx. Um, the other, and there, this is annotated, so you can kind of see, although it's, I mean, it's excessive annotation, which I kind of like. I like excessive, um, excessive clarification is sort of fun to me. Um, but that also, these are objects that you can't see in isolation. Not only do they change every time they're exhibited, every time they transit from one place to another or are presented in a different context, they look different, but also that they're reflective so that you always either see yourself or someone else within them. You can't see them as separate from their own context. There's no stable kind of idealized form of their presentation. There's no coherent type of exhibitionality. And that, to me, opened up this question of the, the meaning that an object has accrues over time as people make use of it. And I wanted to make a thing that also changed over time as it was being put to use that wasn't about the stasis of a particular thing or the autonomy of a thing from its circumstance, but grew along with its functionality or along with people wanting to put it to some kind of functional use. These came out of the, um, these are called transparencies. They're also titled with the airport codes. And every time I travel, I take a sheet of, or two sheets actually, of four by five uh, film with me in my check baggage. So it's a way to also use this sort of compulsory form of travel that becomes part of the itinerant lifestyle of being an artist, which I feel like is very much about being in like airports and planes, and using that as a kind of generator as well, using that movement, um, that sort of excessive, it felt like excessive travel for a while, um, as an aesthetic generator. They're contact printed. These are details that you can see. I think that's LAX JFK, if I remember right. And here they are framed. You can kind of see. And they exist by year. I believe this is 2013. Nope, 2017. And this is the titling for them. So dates, airports, um, and so on. Here you see the mirror, this is a mirrored floor. Um, this is that earlier slide was it um, being shown in LA. This is in Moscow. This is also in LA here. And this is at uh, Brandeis at the Rose Museum. It's installed uh, unbroken, it's double paned. Um, um, it's mirror pane, so it's a double pane glass with a 3M coating on top, a non-slip coating, and it cracks as it's being sort of used. So I, want to make a, I wanted to make a work that used the act of viewing to, as a transformational or a sort of catalyst for the transformation of the object itself. Again, it's reflective, so it always changes depending on time of day and its use within the space. Um, it's built to the edge of the, of the space itself. This was at, this is at Regan Projects in LA. This is in Beijing. And that it produces a kind of fragmentation or a constant transformation also of the room itself. So that you see the reflection of the space and that reflection of the space, that image of the space is constantly transforming at the same time. I also made the FedEx boxes out of copper. Copper intrigued me because it's a highly reactive metal, of course. Um, it, it tarnishes, it doesn't tarnish like iron does. In other words, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it won't rot through with oxidation. Oxidation actually protects it. It also transforms in terms of what it comes into contact with, whether it's like the, um, and also depending on what person, what their pH balance is. Some people are more acidic, some people are more base. And it changes color depending on who's touching it. Also the way that it's handled, of course. So it creates a kind of index of the physical contact that this object has as it moves from place to place. So rather than the FedEx glass boxes that um, crack and refract light differently depending on how they've been treated, these were sort of dependent on how physically they're handled and the labor involved in moving them from one place to the other. 
these are a bunch of, and there's an example of the titling for those. I'll leave them up longer when they seem more informative. But. And that started a kind of long uh, engagement with uh, the notion of the use of copper as a kind of material, as a, as a material that was highly reactive, that absorbed and, and responded to its circumstance, to its context, to its use, and the way that it was sort of, um, and, and especially the contact with human bodies, the, the contact that it comes into with individuals. Um, this is one of the first ones I did. These, this was a, a small gallery in LA. It's the annoying dog that lived in the gallery, just sat on the desk. I don't think I ever saw it walk. Um, and this is just sort of the progression. And that was the object after its use. Um, I'm going to just sort of read a, a, a passage that kind of explains it so that it's a little bit more <laughs> straightforward. Um, here we go. Um, the tabletop copper surrogate works um, are comprised of polished raw copper panels built to the dimensions of pre-existing tables or desktops in use in an exhibition space. In short, the design of the pre-existing table is taken as a ready-made form. During their production, the copper tops take the place of a normal table or desktop and are used in a as a conventional table or desktop would be. The tops are installed for a finite period of time, usually according to some temporal metric that is natural to the exhibition space. In a gallery, one show rotation would be an example of such a metric. Once it is used for this period of time, production of the work has been completed, and from this point on, the work should be handled as a conventional work of art. The other element of this work, which is present in the final display, is a black crinkle-coated steel support that is built to the same shape and dimensions as the tabletop's original support. These two elements comprise the work and should not be separated under any circumstances even though collectors like to stick them in storage and just present the copper part, but they own it, they can use it however they want. But this is an example, and there's the base that's reconstructed of its crinkle coat. And this is under the, the these are from explanatory texts that I was sort of writing because I got sick of telling the same exact stories over and over, and also every time I would tell them, I would do it more poorly. Um, which you maybe can tell that I'm <laughs> doing things more poorly. Um, so this is under the subheading Art and Furniture. The features of the furniture present in, the, in exhibition spaces and the activities they support affect the meaning of art objects on display in those spaces directly. I was thinking about how my London gallery had these really tasteful, like, Paul Keir home tables, like nice, good old-fashioned, mid-century, you know, classiness. And then, and that um, I was working with a gallery in New York that had IKEA tables, and how that created a kind of, that it sort of informed the notion or the presentation structure of like, of the objects themselves, what they're being displayed. It kind of telegraphed to a viewer, much in the same way architecture would sort of frame an object and explain or present a certain kind of impression to an audience member or a viewer, and change the meaning of a work, that the use of different types of furniture and table and taste also informs the understanding of what objects are being presented in a particular context. Um, so just continuing, these choices indicate the aesthetic management of exhibition spaces in the backstage offices, which construct an aesthetic field for the work, inflecting the perception of the work by showing accoutrements, which are, if not complementary, at least within the same range of tastes. Like the, architecture, like the architecture of the exhibition space, the furniture offers a depiction of at least one possible aesthetic, aesthetic sphere of the work. Equally important are the discussions and negotiations that occur on and around these surfaces, i.e. the work of the gallery or the exhibition space, which define how the work is distributed and how it is understood by the work's stewards, be they collectors, art critics, journalists, curators, or art dealers. In other words, discourse also forms the understanding and the meaning of art objects. And the discourse occurs across these work tables where a certain type of, I mean, I don't like the term, um, Lazzarato calls it immaterial labor, but performance and movement and discourse 
is material labor. I mean, I don't really see how it's immaterial. But immaterial labor is a good way to, to separate it out as a kind of discourse-based labor that happens in the construction and meaning of an art object. Every time it's re-narrated, uh, every time it's explained, every time it sort of enters into another form of circulation, its meaning is sort of transformed. And I wanted to chart that type of meaning that existed in the backstage of the exhibition space. And that's a title for one of them. So it includes the cost of production, who produced it, the original design, location of the original gallery, who worked at the table, and so on and so forth. And in other words, to take people who are usually backstage types of workers, gallery directors, gallery interns, gallery assistants, and so on, and incorporate and acknowledge, in a sense, their uh, collaborative sort of function within the presentation of the work. And I like that picture of Friedrich. That's uh, my New York dealer. Looking very serious. And this is table. This is another set of tables that I showed in Petzl in New York. These are all the various working tables. You can see the way that they tarnish differently depending on who's using them and how they're using them. So this is a body of work that also started in, this started in 2006 or seven. They're called selected works. They're works that I decide not to exhibit. And what I do is I either shred them or put them through, um, yeah, shred them basically, but sometimes I have to go to an industrial shredder and then reconstitute them as boards. Um, and you, because a large amount of it is paper pulp, it binds to itself. So there's no additive added to it. It's just reconstituted sort of digested art objects. And they're called selected works because they're essentially selections that happen in the margins of other selections. Active selections, every choice produces a side effect. And those side effects are as much informative or as much a support for the active aesthetic choice as the sort of unthought or the sort of, um, how do I say it, a kind of uh, absence of choice. And this is a detail. But I also was trying to think of my work as a general ecology, part of a larger system, and that also needed to deal with its own byproducts, its own, its own sort of processing of material and information and so on. These are called copper remnants, and they come from the production of the copper tables. And they're basically shapes and forms that were generated by my fabricator to most efficiently use that size sheet of copper. So when I saw that he had those, um, I decided they're also significant in relationship to the actual objects. So you can see the two tables back there, those circular tables, and then on the ground are the, are the remnants that sort of are associated with their production. But I like the idea of a composition that was simply produced by the most efficient or, or uh, complete use of a, of a sheet of copper for the production of those objects. <clears throat> This is an exhibition that I did at the Kunsthalle Malmö in Sweden. Um, and the reason why I'm showing this is this is the first time I used standard copper sheets. And I didn't use them as tabletops, but instead they were simply formed to, um, they were simply handled during installation and deinstallation. You can kind of see them here. And there's a, and then they went from that exhibition to an exhibition in Madrid. and. Um, that's the accumulation of them being presented and represented. And then this is in Switzerland. And because the size and the shape of the object changes, so they're only handled by art installers. That's the only, those are the only people who touch them. They're only touched in the process of hanging it on the wall or taking it off the wall. And because of the size and shape of the object, it means that they get handled in different ways. So when you have a flat sheet, that's of a certain weight, it's handled by a certain number of people, and depending on the number of people, it's handled in a different way than, say, a bent large copper piece like these would be. They also, in almost all of my work, except for, say, the travel pictures, I think, have no top or bottom or left or right, so they can be positioned in any arrangement. And I think of them in some sense as kind of like a tool or a spatial tool in that way. 
So that's a sort of example of uh, an early titling for this piece, actually, because it traveled after this point. But every time it's installed and deinstalled, those, those dates go on the, on the work. And that's a half bisection of a single standardized copper sheet size. That makes sense. This is a 10-part um, separation of a bent copper sheet. And again, it can be presented in any way. And that's the same. So this was the work when it first was produced, or one of them when it was first produced in LA. And then this was recently, I just had a survey show at um, the Contemporary Art Museum in Geneva, and this piece went there. So this is sort of its progression over time. This is another presentation of the work that was in Switzerland, in uh, Zurich. <clears throat> and there you can see the full set. Yeah, no gloves. So I'm just showing variations on the same. They can be presented, like I said, in any configuration that someone might want. And it's better when I'm not involved. Uh, this is an exhibition in Berlin. It was called Gastarbeiten, um, which is sort of a it's a poor use of German, but to take the word Gastarbeiter, which is uh, the guest worker, and to make it into an, uh, a noun, like to guest work. Um, playing with that idea of, like, as an artist, you're constantly dropped into these circumstances, they, in, into a situation or a community or a context where that you have absolutely no, no direct relationship with, and then produce something there and then exit. It's kind of a form of um, migratory, migratory work. It was a um, it was a BMW dealership and also a gay nightclub, and the ceiling worked for both. So this was the this is the exhibition at the Barbican, uh, partial partial disassembling. I won't say the whole thing again. Um, the titling comes from a talk that Hollis Frampton gave in 1979 um, at the Whitney Museum. And it was a talk about outmodal, out, outmoded technology. Uh, invention without a future is a quote from Louis Lumiere talking about the cinematograph. Um, I might have that wrong. I always conflate cinematograph and, and uh, it's a praxis scope. It's cinematograph. Um, and talking about cinema as an invention without a future. Um, so this is all cellulose-based material using cyanotype. Um, uh, potassium ferrocyanide, which is a, one of the earliest photographic um, processes. It's a printing out paper. It just reacts to UV light, but it's very slow. In other words, you just can take it and put it outside. Um, it's very adaptable, quite easy to use, and it fixes in water, which means you can process it, and it's, um, uh, it's not a complicated uh, chemical. And, um, and uh, What's more is, uh, what was it? Oh, and it bonds to cellulose. So any plant-based type of material from cotton to paper to wood, it'll bond directly with. Um, it's a, some, it's a, a work that I was producing. It's 9,222, that seems too convenient, um, objects that take up a total surface area of 14,329 square feet. Um, produced between October 9th, 2013 to October, um, October 8th, 2014. <clears throat> and it's basically, uh, it was to try to make, take the studio, it's all the debris produced by the studio, and to take the materials that come into the studio, every, every, every box, but also anything personal, bank statements, um, my prescriptions to um, emails, uh, discussions about the budget for that, this show and other shows, stupid invites to things, cards, everything that sort of passes through the studio as a kind of machine, thinking of all the inputs and all the outputs of the studio. Uh, the studio is kind of like an active, um, uh, not so much a machine, but maybe an apparatus. 
a, a sort of uh, uh, incorporation of individuals and, and machinery as a kind of production unit and to make a work that described its own making. In other words, told the entire story, but that the entire transparency or total transparency in this case also became completely opaque. Um, in the sense that there was so much information that you can't really do anything with it. Um, how am I doing on time? We okay? Yeah, we're kind of, are we okay? Is this fine? Yeah? Good? Yeah, okay. So these are some detailed images. Oh, that's my gallerist's cell phone number. But I was interested in the way the studio and also this work would then absorb the entire situation around it, would sort of acknowledge all the different forms of social relations that came through correspondence and other types of material that were also physical, that were materially indexed or had a kind of physical trace attached to them and then became repurposed and put straight into the work. There's also a 57 volume set of 50% of, um, reproductions of every object in the show, which was a really bad idea. But I did it anyway. It took too much work. Uh, this is the, uh, this is uh, the 2015 uh, Venice Biennial. Um, and these were, this was a body of work I produced in, in Guadalajara at um, Ceramic Asuro, which is a ceramics factory there that um, traditionally produced both artist editions, but also ceramics and tiles for um, international hotels, for homes, and so on and so forth. The structure that a lot of ceramics production um, has been moving out of um, uh, wealthier countries or countries where the where wages are higher because the the they're simply not cost effective to produce. So you have the English actually exporting English porcelain now, which they didn't used to do, and not producing it um, in England any longer, for the most part. Um, and so filling up that kind of gap was this this studio in Guadalajara, and the, and the way that they usually worked would be an artist would come in there and say, like, make, make me 60 Red Bull cans out of ceramic, and then I'll go sell them in um, France. And, uh, and I wasn't really interested in that, but what I was interested in was all the side effects and the waste products that they had just sort of hanging around, and it was just filled with all these old projects of theirs. And that these materials, these objects, all constituted its kind of, the kind of history of the place itself. To use these, these things that had been left behind and reconstitute them into works. So um, the works that I ended up producing incorporated parts of other artists' work alongside of um, decor and um, just dumb knickknacks and crap like that. I also had seen, um, while I was in Guadalajara, um, I hadn't been, I'd been aware of Jose Clemente Orozco, the, he's one of the um, Trace Grandes, the, the big three Mexican muralists, but I hadn't seen very many of his murals in, per, in, in person, and I was really struck. He had a suite of 57 murals in the Hospicio de Cabanas that were painted in 1937. Um, they were commissioned by the Catholic Church, but of course, with Orozco, he always criticized whoever commissioned him alongside of criticizing almost everyone. So he painted in the Supreme Court, uh, in the courthouse, he painted um, politicians taking bribes, which was pretty charming. And then, so I mean, it was always sort of stuff like that. So this had a very negative depiction, not only of the Mexican Revolution, or kind of critical, uh, criticism of, the, of um, uh, the tumultuous history after the revolution, but also um, the Spanish and also the way the church was functioning and the political circumstance within, um, within Mexico. And there was a kind of um, incredible sort of uh, uh, 
political immediacy to the work and social commentary that also is coupled with a very strong formalist and kind of classically modernist formalist kind of um, approach, using fragmentation and, and flatness and compression within the work. And um, depicting bodies, primarily fragments of bodies, bodies in different states of duress um, under different forms of suffering, um, both pictorially compressed but also um, being depicted in acts of suffering at the same time, uh, depicting like also the, the Spanish as combinations of mechanical and, and, and um, like taking conquistador type outfits and adding gears and machinery to them and compressing this sort of notion of colonialism, economic colonialism with, um, well, no, uh, colonialism is always economic colonialism, but a kind of brutality of that colonialism and drawing it into the 20th century. And I was thinking about the status of this, um, this ceramics factory that actually was successful just because of inequities of wage labor and lack of protections for the workers that they were using or, or a different standard of living than the places that they were exporting to. And that um, in these fragments was a similar type of debris or detritus left over from a, 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 of a quasi-colonial, at least economic colonialism that was very convenient for, um, uh, for balances or global balances of power or trade relations. And while I was there, I also noticed that, um, I mean, what was amazing about Guadalajara is they have six daily newspapers and we live in a city that kind of has one and is bigger. And, um, but I would see them, and they also were sort of populated by images. Um, uh, the tabloids, especially, were, were almost always led off with um, what felt like uh, highly resonant themes with the Orozco murals. So it would be like a, a mostly a cartel mur murder on the cover, um, and then it would be like, the, in the tabloids, and then naked ladies, and then sports. So it would be like all these different forms of bodies in different t states of duress and fragmentation throughout the entire um, newspaper. And that also the cartel murders were directly in relationship with the, with the illegal trade between Mexico and the United States. So it was another mapping of global trade, in other words, drug export and also the movement of guns south um, over the border that was producing this kind of entertainment uh, value to this tabloid newspaper. There were some great headlines too, like someone who had gotten um, murdered in front of a, a taco stand and it just said, carnitas. It was pretty dark. So at the same time, I started collecting those newspapers and this is an example of the title of one of them. And I'll skip forward to these production of one of the ceramics. And I think it's in this image. They were also put outside. So um, this is in the, the Scarpa Garden at the Biennial. And this is in the Giardini, the garden at the Biennial, the outdoor garden. I talked about the curls before, but I had inherited a, a photographic processor from uh, UC Irvine when they were sort of closing down their chemical darkroom. And it was a kind of suffering machine. And over the years, I had started making these curls, which I showed, showed earlier. But using the same type of process, these are black curls. Um, the only difference between these and the previous ones are that they're just made by um, not moving the paper in between exposures. So in a perfect situation, they would just be simply black and white because cyan, magenta, and yellow on top of each other would create a black and white type of image. Um, but because of misregistration that the paper moves, the circumstances in the room, vibrations, HVAC systems, the weight of the paper itself tugging on itself, you have these sort of misregistrations and that produces these pops of color that you see coming out in different places. But as the machine started suffering more and more, it started jamming, and then you have these sort of index marks of the rollers from the, the machine itself. You can see them also there. So it was a kind of, it, it also started depicting the decay of this, of this RA4 processor. It's when the thermostat went out. And this is another thermostat problem. This is a stalling problem. 
but that it on its own, as it was sort of decaying and suffering and struggling, was creating its own kind of image making at the same time. This is wrenching the paper out of the machine, um, and this is cross-contamination, one, one form of chemistry getting on onto the surface. And this is about how big they are in full scale. I mean, you can see a hand up there, so you can get a sense of the scale. This is another. And then these are sandwich prints that we just smushed together and forced through. The irregular frames came from, rather than adopting the work or cutting the work to fit a rectangular frame, um, it was adopting the frame, which was also kind of a stupid idea, but adopting the frame to the shape of the work and offsetting it. An overly complicated idea because they weren't easy to make. Um, thinking about this autopoiesis that a kind of technological object could produce, um, also, uh, I had gotten, I think there's an image of it here. I gotten really upset at my MacBook and just put it on a drill press and popped a hole right through the apple. And it still worked. And I was thinking, oh, that's, that's kind of nice. <laughs> and, um, and that the, the, um, the screen itself, the puncturing of the different layers of Fresnel's uh, produced a sort of image, and it was an image that was generated by the apparatus, the machine, rather than simply being a platform for another kind of image, it was a self-generating type of image. So then I started drilling holes through televisions. And what I liked about it is it wasn't a static type of picture making, it was a picture making that would evolve and change over time. It also came directly out of the use of the raster of the, the object itself, the way that it processed images, and also didn't treat a treat and that object is simply a support for another image, but a generator, a producer of images. Um, also that consumer products like these are bound up tight. They, you're not supposed to open them or look inside of them. So there was a kind of perversity also that I enjoyed about doing this to them. And that's a video of what it looks like. So it just sort of changes a bit. And I also was taking all of these are called office works. Uh, this is a scanner. I couldn't turn off the sound on photo, so you can't hear it make really annoying noises, but you can at least see the eye beam go back and forth. So I thought about actually taking an object and making it like an exploded diagram, so, but still functioning and is this kind of suffering type of machine that was splayed out like a figure that stood in a space like a figure, but also continued to try to perform its automatic function. And thinking about how these design objects, these things are all designed to be sort of somewhat user friendly or communicate a certain kind of personality, a kind of servile type of pleasantness. And to to actually explore that anthropomorphism that they sort of are designed with, like the happy chime of your Mac, and it's like, hey, check your email. That to, to let it suffer, let it spread out, sort of string it up. I'm becoming less and less articulate as this talk goes on, but let's see how that goes. So you can see, uh, and these are 50-50 split TVs, and that should be a video. Oh no, it's not a video. One of them is a video. Anyway, you get the idea. Is there another set of contact print large photograms? It's an iMac. Is that Sierra and it's running? I think it's Sierra. Or no? Yeah. And they start up, so it's also them restarting, seeing that they have an error, they start again, restart. They, they're like, something's wrong, but they don't know what's wrong. And I think that kind of wraps it up for me. How about questions? Questions would be really fun. And thanks for sitting through that.